Because no major battles of the American Revolution were fought on eastern Long Island, the circumstances endured by colonists in Southampton and neighboring towns have tended to go unremarked upon. Yet East End inhabitants' near-universal dedication to the revolutionary cause meant that they would ultimately face six years of military occupation beginning in the wake of General George Washington's defeat in the Battle of Long Island. Southampton residents who were unable to flee across the Long Island Sound to Connecticut either joined military units and took part in combat, or else remained in a village under siege. Early military action came to Southampton in 1775. British troops stationed on warships in Gardner's Bay began raiding East End cattle and stores, and local colonists took immediate measures to protect them. Silversmith Elias Pelletro, too old for combat, was appointed captain of the local militia company made up of young boys and older men like himself. He drilled his troops and earned the highest respect for his loyalty to the rebellion. When he determined that his efforts were of no further use, he was among those who departed for Connecticut, where he remained for the duration of the war. When Captain John Hulbert's 3rd Company, 3rd Regiment of Continental Soldiers was formed on July 2nd, 1775, among the company's numbers was 17-year-old Christopher Vale of Sag Harbor. The company set out for a one-month stay at Fort Ticonderoga, located near the south end of Lake Champlain in northern New York. While Vail was there, 400 British soldiers were taken prisoner and his company was assigned to take some to Connecticut and others to New Jersey. He was back in Sag Harbor in under a year by the 15th of January, 1776. With his tour of duty coming to an end, Vail chose to re-enlist as a private in another company and was stationed at Montauk Point to guard a large quantity of cattle in an effort to deprive the British of crucial food stores. Bale's decision to re-enlist was becoming a choice less frequently shared by his comrades. It is estimated that as many as 80% of those who were in service in 1775 had returned home by early 1776. Enlisted soldiers in the Continental Army endured not only chronic food and equipment shortages, but rampant disease, hard labor, grueling marches, and even abusive officers. Resignation and desertion, unsurprisingly, remained serious problems for the Continental Army throughout the war. August 27, 1776, proved to be a critical day for the people of the East End, as Washington was soundly defeated in the Battle of Long Island. With his retreat through Brooklyn, East End residents found themselves abandoned, isolated from their fellow rebels. Southampton was now at the mercy of an occupying army. Christopher Vale and his company had been ordered to march up island from the east end as reinforcements for Washington's troops. They marched for 40 miles before news of the general's defeat reached them. The company retreated to New Haven, Connecticut, where they soon captured some 60 whaleboats and traveled back across the sound, accompanied by an armed schooner to conduct what turned out to be a successful raid. Vale's company suffered only one casualty, but they killed 13 British soldiers, took 40 prisoners, and commandeered two sloops. The drama of the successful raid was followed by months of hard marching in harsh circumstances as Vale was ordered from fort to fort without seeing action. A very typical experience for a continental soldier. In September 1776, those who had remained under occupation in Southampton were forced under penalty of death to take an oath renouncing His Majesty's rebellious subjects in America. The men of Southampton requested that the terms of the oath be toned down, but to no avail. And the forced oath of allegiance was not the only trouble occupied Southampton faced. British troops were quartered in personal homes, vandalism and plunder were serious problems, and women faced the ever-present threat of sexual assault. Whatever crops the British did not take for themselves, the American forces in Connecticut claimed. The British, in turn, punished the East End for supporting the colonial forces. Fortunately, General Sir William Erskine was commander of the British Occupation Forces in Southampton. Erskine made his headquarters in the old Pelletier House and was credited as being a restraining influence on his subordinates until his resignation. 
The residents of Bridgehampton were less lucky. There, the notorious Major Conqueror commanded occupying troops, and his cruelty became stuff of local legend. It was reported that Conqueror once had a young boy tied up and pretended to shoot at the child to frighten him. When the boy's worried mother sent a slave to retrieve him, Conqueror had the slave tied up in his place and continued to sporadically shoot at him for several hours. In the spring of 1777, Christopher Vale and a number of refugees from Long Island saw action as participants in the storied raid on a British garrison in Sag Harbor. Informed of a plan masterminded by Colonel Jonathan Meggs, Vale wrote, Colonel Meggs provided a number of whaleboats and proceeded with our force for Long Island. We arrived at a place on the north side of the island called Bailey's Beach, which was 14 miles from Sag Harbor. After carrying their boats through the South Hold Beach and then rowing for two or three hours, the 130 raiders made their way from Mill Creek to Sag Harbor. They rowed the boats across the bay until they came to a neck of sand, where they again marched, carrying their boats until they reached the port. There they caught their British unaware. As Vale told it, It so happened that they had completed all their business at this place, and the afternoon before they had received a month's pay and had a sham fight and damned the Yankees and wished them to come over, for there never was a better time. Vale's company did just that, successfully capturing the entire British force except one man. The Continental troops burned all coasting vessels as well as a 60-foot store along the wharf and returned to New Haven, Connecticut within 60 hours, prisoners in tow. In the end, the Sag Harbor raid left 12 British vessels destroyed along with the loss of 120 tons of hay, corn, and oats, 12 hogs head of rum, and various other provisions. Six British were killed and 90 taken prisoner, but the American company did not suffer a single casualty. With this heady escapade under his belt, Vale took his discharge and headed for a new adventure aboard the Continental schooner Mifflin under Captain John Kerr. The Meg's expedition had been an example of what was known as whaleboat warfare, beachfront raids conducted on maneuverable whaling boats. Whaleboat raids originated with strictly military purpose but eventually evolved into outright piracy. From capturing enemy ships and cargo under military command, Vale's company, like other such companies, began to treat non-military merchant ships as equally fair game. In January 1779, Vale abandoned whaleboat warfare and its swiftly fading veneer of respectability altogether. He joined privateers on the 10-gun sloop Revenge and headed for the West Indies. The Revenge was subsequently captured by a British ship, and Vale, now a prisoner himself, was thrown into a dungeon on the 15th of February. After a series of hair-raising attempts at escape, all doomed to fail, he hit on a plan to ease his situation. In his journal, Vale wrote that he began to think what was to be done in my present situation in order to relieve my wants. I took the resolution of drawing figures on paper and staining them with my blood. From selling his drawings, he moved on to crafting clothing and was pleased to report that he was beginning to grow rich. In 1780, after 11 months and 9 days, Vail was released from the dungeon and was brought onto a French ship which engaged in bloody battles in the non-political free-for-all that was European piracy in the West Indies. The American prisoners did not aid their French captors. Vail wrote, We had frequently been called to quarters and threatened several times to be punished, but we always refused the orders and risked the consequences. Since 1776, the tide of the war had been turning, and it finally reached its military conclusion on October 19, 1781, when the British surrendered at Yorktown. On dry land at last, Vale reported from Long Island in August, I remained on shore until November when I got married, and remained at home until next spring, when peace took place. Vale's war was over, a war extraordinarily different from the one experienced in Southampton. Between the surrender at Yorktown in October 1781 and the evacuation of New York City in November 1783, refugees returned to Southampton, facing ruined farms and a village depleted of resources. Evidence of the impoverishment endured during the Revolution is written in the unusual sums voted for poor relief in the post-war years, the numerous changes in property ownership and the overwhelming number of mortgages taken out. In spite of this, the new state of New York levied a tax of $37,000 on Long Island on the grounds that it had not been in a position to take an active part in the war. But whether marching in army units, launching naval raids, or simply attempting to maintain some security in occupied territory, Long Islanders on the East End had been nothing if not active participants in the American Revolution. <laughs>